You'll get to pray for the offering. I will. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. If I sound a bit different tonight, it's, uh, I had a little work in my mouth. So if I, my voice is a little lower, higher, or slurred, it's okay. I'll, it'll be slurred anyway because we'll get inebriated. But beyond that, so Lord, we thank you for your presence tonight. And Lord, we thank you for this offering. Lord, that you can do above and beyond what we can think or imagine. Lord, you're able to stretch out offerings, increase offerings, even in the bucket, even in the envelope. So you are the God of increase. Some sow, some water, but it's you, Lord, who gives the increase tonight. And so, Father, we thank you that only you, we can't give the increase, but you give the increase. So, Father, increase, we speak, and breakthrough in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boom. Hallelujah. How many are here tonight? I have to say, I had one, we had one of the most powerful services that we've ever had in your church on that Monday night. Wasn't that amazing? That was an amazing move of God. God just sort of blew in in Aurora. It was the, the God who is fire came in the church. That was amazing. And the testimonies after were crazy testimony. I like crazy testimonies. Hallelujah. God's good, eh? How many want some fire tonight? How many need some fire tonight? Now... Do you know on, the, on my GPS, it actually has this place, the whole camp, a different color? It actually has the camp. Did you know that? Like, so this camp is, is marked already on the GPS. So when you, when you drive up to it, you can see it changes color, and the whole outline of the camp is a different color, meaning it's something special. So I thought, boy, they, you know, God knows where you are. Isn't that something? On my GPS, it actually has the outline of your camp with the, with the lake in it and the whole thing, a different color and everything else. So praise God. Good. I actually have three notes tonight. Usually I have one note, but tonight I have three. Hallelujah. Because we're breaking through. And, you know, I, I know that I know. How many know, you know, sometimes you just have a meeting and sometimes God shows up. Now, every night God shows up at the tent. But you know that God wants to say something tonight. I don't know what I have for tomorrow, but I know tonight God wants to minister something to us specifically and he wants to minister something personally, and he wants to minister something very deeply in us tonight. And so we want the understanding and the wisdom of God. You see, it's the wisdom of God. Father, we want the wisdom of God tonight. Father, we don't want the top of the barrel. We want the bottom. God, we want to go right to the bottom. We want the oil, but we want the whole thing from the top to the bottom. We want the wisdom of God to be able to come and to be able to move and to be able to expand and to be able to break through into the areas where people have been standing personally, but also for others. And Father, we thank you that you are the God of the breakthrough. And not only the breakthrough, but you're, I see you expanding in this place and on the inside of people. You know, I see barrels blowing up because of the, the pressure of the oil, because God is going to bring forth oil tonight, a specific, not just revival oil. He's going to bring oil that you're, you're going to need, oil that's going to break through, and the anointing that breaks the yoke, because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. So I believe that God is here to minister oil, an anointing that is going to bring you the breakthrough because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. That's what the Bible says. How many want that kind of oil? Because literally the word anointing means an oily substance with a healing property. That's what it is. An oily substance with a healing property. So I want the oily substance with a healing property from God. How many want that? You know, when you say the name of Jesus, that, that's what comes, comes to you, if you believe it. It's in the Song of Solomon. Your name is like ointment poured forth. And so I saw the angel of the Lord here, ready to minister. Now, God's going to minister to, uh, to you. But I know when the angel of the Lord shows up like this, God wants to do something very special and very deeply. And it doesn't matter, you know, the, in, in the circles that we walk in, some people say, well, I've heard it before. That's okay. You need, we need to hear it again. However... It's one thing to have a vision. It's another to have the vision come to pass. And God is about to bring the visions and the dreams that he's given people for many, many years. He's about to give them fulfillment in this season. Because this is the season of the harvest of all things. Because the end of the age is the harvest. The harvest is the end of the age. And God is going to bring a harvest of every seed that he's ever sown. And if you're at my meeting when I spoke about seeds, every prophetic word is a seed. It has the completion of that word on the inside of it, but it can be very, very small. It can be one word. However, the completion is in that, and God is into bringing forth the seed into fruition. It's what he wants to do, and he doesn't want any abortions in the kingdom. 
But he wants these things to, to, to be brought forth. And I know that I know that as I'm standing here, that you guys have been believing God, not just for yourself, but for, and I'm talking to these guys as leaders, but also everybody in here, that, that you've been believing for yourself, but also for others. And one reason why breakthrough doesn't come as easily as we think it, it should or as quickly is because of the sphere of influence that God has given to us. And I know that God told me in December of last year, he said, this year you're going to see and begin to see f- uh, fulfillment and breakthrough in Canada that we saw for years in Asia. And, you know, I shared about the billionaires we have run into and the words, the $100 million words and different words that we've been able to give and see it come to pass. I'll tell you, when, you sit into, when you're talking to a pastor and you're three feet away and he's just received a $70 million check and is building the fifth biggest church in the nation of Korea, like, like Pastor Beyond. And from a word that, that, that we gave him a few months earlier, when you see the fulfillment of these things, you guys, it changes your life. Because you're not living in a place of hope deferred. You're living in a place of fulfillment. And it's two different places. It's like being on this side of the promised land. You still have to be faithful and believe God. However, when you're in the promised land, everything's different. You don't need, you, they didn't eat the manna. Did you know the day they, the day they went in, they didn't eat, the manna stopped falling? Yeah. We've been eating. You know what? I like the manifestation of manna, so if you have that, God bless you. But in the spirit realm, we've been eating a lot of manna. Praise God. However, God wants us to go in and eat the fruit of the land of the promises that God has given us. That is why I'm here tonight. And I know that. And I'm here to believe with you. I'm also here to speak the word. Because Canada is going to get its designated move of God from God. From God. It, it will, it, it, she will have her move of God, one way or the other. And so what God wants us to do is to press in together and believe for something bigger than yourself. If you're just believing for yourself, for breakthrough, you, you know what? You want, to, you, you want to have your breakthrough come a whole lot quicker? Live by this scripture. It is better to give than to receive. Ooh, hallelujah. God taught me that. My brothers got saved because I went and, went and got other people's brothers saved. I went out and witnessed to other people, and they got saved. And I got other people's mothers saved. I got other people's fathers saved. And when I went and did that, God began to move my own family. Now, that's not all the, always the way that it is. However, if you're stuck in a rut in believing for the things of God, start looking outward, not inward. You'll just get depressed if you looked inward. Because the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. I'm, I'm speaking in the spirit realm. Because God wants to give you oil. And I'll tell you why I know God wants to give us oil tonight. Uh, we have, God's given us a nice vehicle. And however, I'm automotively challenged. Anybody relate to that? Anybody automotively challenged? I am. And uh, I know where the engine is. And you know, I bought a Volkswagen van years and years ago. I didn't realize that it's, it's not water cooled or anything, right? It's a fan. And then when the fan quits, the engine blows up. And it did. I was driving a boom, fire. And that was back in the 80s, I think. So, I mean, I didn't know that Volkswagen's bands, you know. However, I, you know, my vehicle now, I take it in. They fix it up. They check it up. They change the tires. They change the rim. Do whatever they need to do. I just bring it in. They're really good. It's in the town we live in. And, and uh, however, we're not home a lot. And so I never, I never check the oil, period, ever. And I just send it in, and they just, okay, change the oil. Well, they, they changed staff, and the head of the place, you know, I didn't know me, and I didn't know, well, so they weren't checking the oil no more. So we got in our van yesterday morning. Shirley was with me. Our car, pardon me, not van, car. And um, see, I'm automotively challenged. And so, <laughs> wow. It's time to drink tonight. Tonight's a good night of drinking. Hallelujah. God just wants to smear that oil all over you. Oh, oh, oh. So I got in, and the, the Lord said, uh, you need an oil change, just like that. And I thought, I do? So I'm, we already left to come here. It was like, for us to come here, it's like close to a 10-hour drive to drive from where we are in Quebec. So I, I was driving like 15 minutes. Now, remember, we'd driven here a couple of weeks ago all the way here and back. That's a long ways. And... Um, and so, and then I drive, like, two minutes later, you need to check your oil. I said, like, right now? God says, check your oil. Right now. Oil. I told Shirley, I'm taking the next exit. We got on the freeway. We got off the next exit in Quebec. I went. I, c- 
couldn't, you know the thing that, what do you call that? The dipstick. <laughs> Wouldn't come out. I'm yarding on this thing. And I'm like, what's wrong with, it won't come out. I'm yarding on this thing. It wasn't just stuck. There was no oil in the vehicle. There was no oil. I finally pulled it out and the thing, there was no oil. And I put it back in. I pulled it out. I, I went, it's not measuring. It's not even on the end. There's nothing. It's, I thought, this is not good. So, I put in three quarts, and it went about three quarters of the way where it's supposed to be. And I said, Lord, I told Shirley, if we would have driven here, our, our engine just would have been toast. And then, but the Lord spoke this to me. Doesn't matter how good the outside looks, because we have a nice looking vehicle. It doesn't matter. The outside can be good. You get a big engine. You can have a 5.6. You can have a, yeah, all the bells and whistles. doesn't matter. What matters is, today, tonight, is if you've got oil in the vehicle. That's what matters. Listen, the one thing the Bible teaches very clearly, Jesus talked about, you know, the ten virgins. And, and, and whoever that is, you know, it means some things to some people. But I will say this, extra oil is good. And the issue was, the reason that, that half of them didn't make it is they ran out of oil. Now, it's not the oil that, you know, you, you can't see by holding up a pot of oil. You know, take your oil and hold it up. The oil goes into the lamp, but you have to light the lamp, and it's the fire. You see because of the fire, right? So you have to understand the oil that you put in your car just sort of lubricates the, the engine so it can run. But if you don't have any oil, that engine, I'll tell you what, I, I couldn't even pull the thing out. It was that stuck. That's not good, by the way. So I'm going to remember that and check my oil regularly. Hallelujah. <laughs> Can't trust other people to check your oil. That, that won't work. Because your vehicle could, could look great. I mean, I had people coming up and go, is that the same vehicle you had six years ago? You got a brand new vehicle? I said, no, because I keep it up on the outside. But it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. What's on the, what's on the inside of the engine? I said, God, what are you saying? And you know, I know that this is the season to preach this, because God already told me last year to preach this. But you can get extra oil now before it's too late. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. You can get it tonight, because God's serving it up. You know, God's so good, he doesn't have to do any of this. He doesn't have to give us nothing, but he does. You say, well, it's his nature. Yeah, but he chooses. God loves because he chooses to love. Can you imagine that? Do you know that God makes choices every day? He does. You're made in his image, but he makes right ones every day. Hallelujah. And you say, well, yeah, he loves me because he got to. Well, he loves you, but some people he likes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Friendship with God is not knowing every, how to quote every scripture in the Bible. Because the Pharisees did. They had a smaller one. But they did. They could quote the whole Bible. And, when, and they believed. They were hoping they would be the ones that would be there when the Messiah came. And when he came, they killed him. So a lot of people who know the Bible up and down, back and forth, and can quote it. You need to know the Bible. But you need to know Jesus. No, you, we really do. Because... The only way you're going to be safe in these last days is to, be, is to hear the voice of the Lord. There's no other way that you're going to make it unless you hear the voice of the Lord. You need to hear the word of the Lord, right? Hear the word of the Lord. Israel, hear the word of the Lord. However, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Oh, hallelujah. I had a number of dreams. I dream almost every single night. And I had dreams. I, I was in meetings. I'm like, I don't like these kind of... I was in meetings and the Holy Spirit took me to the meeting. And often the Holy Spirit looks like Sammy. Don't ask me why. My son. In my dreams. He does. He just... And so the Holy Spirit, he sort of looks like Sammy. Then he's gone. And I know it's the Holy Spirit because, you know, he's not... Do you know the Holy Spirit's not embarrassed of your personality? He's not embarrassed of your personality. In other words, you know, we can have every person in this room come up and prophesy. It's going to sound different. It's going to come a different way, different intonation, and the Holy Spirit's not embarrassed by any of it. Isn't that amazing? That's the, that's the kind of God you serve. He didn't make us clones. When you get saved, you're a clone. You, you, you speak exactly the same way. No. He made you. And you're only fulfilling your destiny as you begin to walk with him. Oh, oh, oh. So here comes the Holy Spirit. He took me to churches. And I saw there was like groups of 50 people worshiping the Lord. And the Holy Spirit would say, that one there belongs to me. And I'm like, what do you mean that one there belongs to you? What about the rest? No, he didn't say about the rest. He said that one. I have one. One? 
I'll tell you, that's a freaky dream. One. And I looked at him. And, and I don't know if you've ever had this. I've had a number of times in, in my dreams, I had this Holy Ghost magnifying glass. And I, it brings the person up close and I can see humility. Almost like an oil. All over the person. Humility. And then, God, and then the Holy Spirit took me to another church. Same thing, another church, same thing, another church, same thing, another church, same thing. I say, God, that's not a good percentage. You can get oil tonight. Why do I say these things? Because God says them to me. But this is Canada's hour, you guys. Whether Canada knows it or not, it's Canada's hour. Whether the church knows it or not. You know, many times we've missed, we've missed our hour of visitation, but not this time. Do you know that Canada has? Many nations have. Israel did. Jerusalem did. They missed their hour of visitation. Jesus, walking around. They didn't even know it was the Messiah. Most people. And God often says to me, what makes you think you're going to know? He tells me. What makes you think you're going to recognize me? The only way that you're going to recognize him is if the Holy Spirit in you tells you what to do and what's real and what's not. Now, you need to know the Bible, by the way. I love the Bible because I'm a word person. I love the word. That's why many times when I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm like, God, I'm so out there. I'm, I'm past the dock. I mean, I don't know where I am. You know what my anchor is every time? The word. The word, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. It's your anchor. It's your covering. It's everything. But you need to read the word to find Jesus, not to find knowledge. And that's the difference. Don't read the Bible to get more knowledgeable. Read the Bible to know Jesus. And if you do, you'll get to know him. And then he'll speak to you right out of his word. And he'll tell you stuff. You know, there's going to be a lot of building in this season. I'm going to say this for your own good. You need to figure out what it means because of the dream. I have a series of dreams sometimes. You ever have a series of dreams? Or you wake up, you go back in the dream, you wake up, you go back, you wake up. And there's all sorts of building going around. That's why I'm careful where I minister. Now, a lot of people wouldn't have me anyway in their churches. Praise God for that. But that's a safety. <laughs> it is. So it's a safety for them and me, I guess. But in the, we're going to see some buildings going on. They're going to look pretty good, but it won't be God. So follow God. But I'm, I'm here, I believe, by a mandate from God. Now I got invited because I like these guys. And, and they have a work. And I, I'm not preaching yet. This is an appetizer. So this isn't preaching. This is the free stuff. But there's oil tonight. Oh, yeah, there's oil. Oh, God, give us oil. Many times I turn into this. This is what happens to me. I become an oil, whatever you call it. And I just, I start pumping up the oil. That's just what happens. Especially in Alberta. I just go haywire. Because the the oil and the spirit, listen, in Canada, there's so much of it. The enemy doesn't want it out. He doesn't want that news out. He wants to close everything down and make everything dry and reduce everything to a doctrine and no life. Got to preach good doctrine, but you got to have life. Jesus didn't come to give you dryness. He came to give you life, not more abundantly. Why? Because he wants the world to see that he is a God of his word. Do you know that? That's what it boils down to. He wants the world to see that he is a God that says what, that does what he says. And that means what he says. He's looking for a people. That's it. Not a gifted people. Not the most, you know, wonderful, you know, outgoing, best speakers. Not looking for that. He's looking for people that are going to obey his word. And do what he says to do. And can demonstrate his power on the earth. And prove to the world. Whether, whether they, you know, whether they even believe you or not. They still, one day they're going to have to bow the knee. And say, yeah, Jesus is alive in you. But before they die, we want them to come into the kingdom. Amen. So here's a word for many people in here. The reason your breakthrough hasn't come yet, or you're on the verge of it. Some of you, I just see that like one more layer we got to go through. is because you're believing for others and not just you. Some of you don't know that. And that's why when you, when you listen to the Lord, I know what I'm doing. Listen, this whole year, it's not just for my breakthrough. I'm, bre- I'm pressing into breakthrough for the kingdom and the body of Christ in Canada, especially in the area of finances and wealth. And you know, we're... Um, God's an amazing God, eh? And you know what? We have all sorts of people come to our conferences, too. We have all the holy rollers that come out. And, uh, but I believe that this season is going to be not just a season of big offering. That's great. These, you know, I would, you know, if you feel to give again, you should give again tonight. That's a good thing. Really, it is. We've been in meetings where the spirit of God, I mean, I was in, uh, where was I? I was in Alberta. Yeah, I was in Red Deer, and the anointing of God just fell on me. 
What's that? Red Deer, Red Deer Alberta. They'd already received the offering. And the anointing fell on me. And I started talking about the day that Michael Jackson died. And if you've ever, I think I, I, I gave that message at your church. So you, they probably have the message. It's, on the day that Michael Jackson died, everything changed. But people didn't realize what happened. Because they watched too much CNN and they don't listen to God. And so, you know, God told us what happened. God told my wife two hours before he died. Two hours before we heard that, that he had died. That something was going to happen today. And the whole thing, how I ended up in England, in the very place that Michael J- uh, Jackson was supposed to be that day. But he died. I ended up there supernaturally. Just happened to be there in the building where he's supposed to do his, his, his concert. And they're going to renew his, his uh, they're going to redo his whole thing, a new CD. They're going to build a, uh, um, uh, what you call it, a casino in Las Vegas called Thriller, and all this is going to happen. I don't have time to, you guys, do you have that message? You might be able to dig it up, right? But anyway, I only gave it a few places, so maybe you guys just keep it to yourself. But anyway, you get the dessert. How's that? And how there was a release, and how God showed me what had been stolen from the church. And it's a little bit of what I'm going to preach on, not that specifically, but what's been stolen by the enemy for the next generation. Because the next generation, the enemy is only interested in, not only, but if you watch commercials, mostly where, where, where the world goes after, they're going after young people. You don't see a whole lot of older people at a party drinking beer on TV. This is, right? You just don't. Why? Because that's who the enemy's after. He's targeting that age group. Because he knows if he can get them there, they've got a whole lot more power and money than what you think. Kids have money all the time. How do I know? I worked in the high school for years. <laughs> I'm like, how do you have all this stuff? Well, I don't know how they get it, but they got it. Billions of dollars every year go into, go into the music industry. Did you know that? The world of music industry. Most of it by young people. See, we don't realize what's going on, you guys. God wants to bless you and your children and your children's children. How do I know that? Because on the way here, I saw a great big eagle and a bunch of eaglets. Yeah. Big eagle, bunch of eaglets. And we're after the next generation. By the grace of God, we're going to get it. Now, what do you mean get it? Number one, we need people that speak the same language as the generation that's coming up. That's why God told me, if we didn't release what we had now, we'd lose our voice. That's what he told me in a dream. Two dreams. Bob Jones came in my dream, told me the same thing. Then I saw Michael Douglas. He had throat cancer, couldn't talk. God said, you'll be just like him. You and your age group of the prophetic, you're going to lose your voice. We don't give it right now to the next generation. So I'm like, how do you do that? And so we're having schools starting this year for young people in the prophetic, and that's it. Uh, under 40. So Now, do us over 40 people get it? Yes. But hopefully we've got some to give away. That's why you have it. You know why you have it? It's not just for you. It's to give away. Might as well give it to the next generation because I want my son to bypass me and I want his children to bypass him. So how do I do that? By giving away, by giving away, by giving away, by giving away. How do we do this? It's by giving away, by giving this away. You know what? The ultimate, you know, I feel like preaching this to women. We, uh, you know, surely as women's conferences, I get to preach on the last night now. Yeah, the ultimate calling of a woman is... I mean, to love God, but it's to be a mother. You don't hear that preach on Oprah. They don't celebrate pregnant women. When, have you, when do you ever see that? Because they don't like to talk about that. They talk about the other stuff. But if you woman, women, God's same as me. What's my ultimate calling? To be a father. That's what it is. To be a good husband, yes. But my ultimate calling as a human being is to be a father. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise God, I'm telling you. That's why God chose Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to raise up his children after him. I'm talking not just natural. I'm talking the spirit right now. But your ultimate calling is to birth. See, women, birthing is way more important. The devil's trying to just slide that right out of the picture. And every other right that a person has, is like that's left in the, in, in the dust. However, children, I'm telling you, Revelation 12, God told me this is the year of Revelation 12. We're in Revelation 12 right now. Right now, Revelation 12. You can read it. I can tell you where we are. And this year is going to be a good year. Hallelujah. 2012. Yes, it will be. Now, for some, not so much. But the Bible says there was a woman with 12 stars on her head. And she was crying out in pain, about to give birth. Hallelujah. Thank God for the women. Amen. Now, you know what? Being in pain and giving birth, I've never experienced that, thank God. But it doesn't sound too good or too thrilling. Right? Right? But is it a good thing? Yes, it is. Does it feel good? Nope. God told me one day, you don't like pain, do you, Charlie? And I'm like, oh, man, he figured me out. I don't like pain. (laughs) 
We're not going to have an altar call for pain. But you know what? There's a birthing going on right now. But it's not just a birthing. Hallelujah. We want to see those children, young people in the next generation going on. And the glory of God's about to hit them like a tidal wave. However, we've got to have good people. We don't want to get them all religiousized again. Because most of the moves of God, even the ones in Canada, I won't name them. But I mean some powerful moves of God, even in the past, they dried up. You know why? They lost the language. Some of the guys are still around, and I know them. They give you these pamphlets and these booklets, and it's all old King James and stuff you don't even, I don't even understand. Try giving that to a 16-year-old. They're not going to get it. God wants to give language in the Spirit to people. And so you say, well, you know, I, I'm around young people. I, was around, I mean, I was in the school district for 12 years. I loved it. However, you guys... We need to give the mic to these guys. This is what's going to happen. My son is bypassing me already. You know what he told me? He told me the finances are going to come to his generation. My son before it comes to me. And I'm like, God, I've been believing this for how many years? Going to, your son's going to get it first. Now, that should make you happy. For like 10 seconds, I wasn't that happy. No. That's just like years and years ago. In the 80s, I've been, fa- remember, honey? Fasting and praying. I mean, we did like 24-day fast. We did 21, you name it. I did a soup fast. Man, I was never hungry, and then I learned that soup was food. So anyway, so I wasn't fasting at all. <laughs> and after I, after I prayed for two years, for two years, after I prayed, that was a good fast. I'm like, I could go on forever. <laughs> after two years, pardon me, of praying, God says this. Charlie, you've been praying and faithful, and I, I told you revival's coming, the glory. You've been believing me. He said, what, how would you feel if I give it to the Baptist? I said, the Baptist! That's what I said. I didn't feel too good then either. I said, they don't even like me. He said, it's not yours to give. You're there to believe, and then you're there to give it away. And I'm like, oh, great. That's how it works. Yep. And he says, don't expect to be the guy up there either. Up at the front when it's all happening. I'm like, okay, that hurt too. You see, because here's the thing. Are we interested in the next generation coming? Woo! Praise God, I'm telling you. Yes, we are. You know what? I've been here. This is the third time. I've been here. I never saw that picture. It's in the bathroom in that house. I mean, I saw it, but never looked at it. In the bathroom in the house. And it's got a picture of two eagles and a bunch of eaglets in the inner. And it's, you know, 10 seconds before I looked at it, I had like a picture because God told me on the way here. It's about eagles and about, this is what you guys are doing. You're raising them up. But what's coming is the influx of the young, and they're coming. And they are coming. Yes. And they are coming. Yes. You know, you don't have to go up and say you're an apostle or a prophet or you're a father. But you know what happens? Wisdom is known by her children. That's how it works. I said wisdom is known by her children. Did you know the Bible says that? Wisdom is known by her children. You don't want to be barren. So if you have wisdom, you're going to have children. You're going to have fruit. Fruit that will last. When Jesus said that you'd have fruit, fruit that'll last, it's, it's talking about all sorts of stuff. Oh, hallelujah, but especially the fruit of your womb. Yeah, he is talking. He said in Deuteronomy, amen? He blessed the fruit of your womb. So women, get happy. If you have kids, I don't care if they're 50 and not serving God. You need to stand up and you need to tell them in the spirit exactly what's what. You don't have to tell them, just tell them in the spirit. You can do that, right? You know that. Because your words carry power. Hallelujah. Okay, so now I can preach. Are we ready? Let's go to um, Exodus 19.4. And that is the scripture that's on that picture in the bathroom. And you see, you can get a message out of that? Absolutely. That's how God speaks to me. That's why he speaks to me. Because I, I, I look for the little, and then God will give you much. That's the principle of heaven. If you're faithful with the little, God will give you much. Most people want the much, but they don't want to be faithful with the little. And the little things that seem foolish... Many people just discard them, and then they're they're like, I never hear from God. But God's been trying to speak for years. But often it's little, and sometimes it seems very foolish. But the foolishness of God is greater than man's wisdom. God told me, that's your ministry. I said, what? He said, demonstrate my foolishness. I said, I don't know if I like that. He goes, well, that's what you're called to. How would you like to have that call? The Bible says, the foolishness of God. The Bible says, preaching is foolish. You know that, our, that, you know, you ever read those blogs? Well, I have MSN, I go, you know, it comes up. And then you read, they have, a, they have a newspaper article, then you read all these blogs. You know, people, not blog, what do you call it? They're emailing, and it, I mean, so many people don't believe in God, they want to kick God out of the schools, so that was one big one, the, the Bill Nye the Science Guy. Did you read that? Bill Nye the Science Guy says that teaching your children 
about creation is harmful to them. That's what he said. It was right on the front page. And I, I, think, I thought, yeah, great. So we'll get them into gangs and all that other stuff. That'll be good. But teach them about God. Hallelujah. You know it doesn't work in the world knows it. Hallelujah. Woo! I'm talking about the, wis- the wisdom of God and the foolishness of God is about the sweet Canada. And the young people are going to come in. You know why? They know that's a bunch of junk. How do I know? Because I was in school. I pulled the kids. I'd say, how many of you think that we came from some mush that came out of a lake? Like one kid would put up his hand. This is in a public school. Probably most of them, are, if, not, if all of them aren't Christian. How many of you think that God may have made the earth? Most of the class. That should give you some hope. No, they don't even go to church. But you know what? They're like, that evolution's stupid. <laughs> you know what? God has a lot more faith in young people than what you think. Hallelujah. But he's looking for fathers and mothers. So get ready. Shirley was telling me she was watching a program, and, and the guy was saying, listen, if you're expecting a baby, you're going to build a baby room. You're not going to wait for the baby to come and then do all that. Too late. Right? You're going to prepare, you're going to, whatever you do, right? Hallelujah. Where am I? Where did I tell you to go? Exodus. Exodus 19, verse 4. That's what I was going to say. When I was preaching on, uh, on the day that Michael Jackson died, all of a sudden, a paper airplane came and hit me right in the head. A paper airplane. I thought these, I thought, what kind of a... And, it, and somebody threw a ball of paper at me, right? And, I, and it hit me. And I thought, and there's like, they must have like 1,500 people or so there in their, in their meetings, summer meetings. I thought, who would do that? Look at, so I went to boot the thing away, and I noticed it was a $5 bill. And the paper airplane was a $20 bill. How can you make a paper airplane? But he did, out of a $20 bill. And I thought, what's happening? They're throwing money at me, and all of a sudden, I wasn't talking about money. All of a sudden, they started coming. <clears throat> and they started coming. And they, they had a pile of money, uh, mostly cash, over $14,000. They just came. And they just came in the, because the anointing got so strong, they couldn't help themselves. They had to give. It's going to happen. But we want to be ahead of the curve. When, if you're married to a wife like mine, she's a giver. You learn how to give. My wife is taught. I said, honey, the greatest thing I ever learned from her ever is how to give and how to not be selfish. Because primarily... I was a selfish, selfish human being. And I learned through my wife on how to give. Hallelujah. Woo! And how to receive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. On how to give and how to receive. I said how to give and how to receive. Yes. Don't give not expecting anything. That's not even biblical. I've had people come up and rebuke me. I've spoken and a big speaker comes right after me and says, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. And I'm like, doesn't matter. God does. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Better to give than receive. But what does the Bible say? Oh, hallelujah. You see, if you, if you live by your job, and I know you have to have a job. I mean, I have a job. Everybody has a job of some kind. We do in the kingdom. You have a job in heaven. However... You know, you got to think higher than your job and outside of your job for the finances that you get. You just have to learn how to do it. We don't have an employer. We're it. My wife and I and my son, he, well, he has his own ministry. I wake up in the morning and I go, I don't know how any bills are going to get paid. I don't. But you know, I know one thing. God pays all my bills because he told me what. And he told me one day, Charlie, he said, I'm going to pay all your bills. So what he told me. Now this is what he told me. So he said, I'm going to pay all your bills. I'm not speaking of finances, and we've already received the offering, so we can all relax. But he said this. Do you want big ones or small ones? Bills, he said. And I thought, first, I was going to say, well, small bill. You know, small. And he goes, and I thought, wait a minute. You're paying the bills. All the big ones, please. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. And if he's paying them, well, they're big or small. Why not take big? Because if you understand who your father is, you're going to think that way. No, no, you will think that way, and you'll learn to live above your means. And I've heard people preach, never live above your means. God told me, preach a message, we have it, called living above your means. What do you mean? By writing checks you don't have money for? No, 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 that's flaky. That's stupid, that's stupid, don't do that. Right? Unless God tells you, but you need seven burning bushes for that one. Okay, so... (laughs) What I'm talking about is going up higher and believing God. So if God asks you to do something, if God asks you to do something, right, or to go somewhere, go to the Congo or go somewhere, and he says, will you, John, will you go to the Congo? Now here's, 
meant what many people do. Do you have enough money in the bank? He didn't ask you that. Now, if he asks you, you know, do you have enough money in the bank? Okay, but no. He says, will you go to the Congo? Now, there's, there's two, two answers to give. Yes or no. Maybe it doesn't work. So yes or no. Now, you've got to figure it out. If God's going to pay the bill, the answer is yes. No, the answer is yes. If God asks you, say yes. And you know, I have people, they, I mean, they get mad about all sorts of stuff, right? Woo! Hallelujah. I feel free tonight. Because I am. Hallelujah. By the grace of God. No. You know, I have people that get mad. Because sometimes we have registration at conferences. And many times we have free stuff. But sometimes God says, I want... Re-. And so I have people say, well, I don't have the money. You know, and it's $30. And I understand that. Or, you know, I'm retired. But I, you know what I tell people? Listen. We had, we had two teenage girls. One 14, one 17. And how much did it cost to go to Columbia? Like 1500 1800 whatever. You know they raised it, and they got it within like a couple of months. They got all the money. Just by faith, believing God, and they did a few things. Somebody heard about it. They, they gave them each $1,000. Somebody gave, It just came out of the woodwork because they said yes first. And it came in. So you know what? If you don't have the money, I don't have the money for stuff. However, if you don't have the money and God says to do it, it's going to be there. And I'll tell you what, it'll be there 100% of the time, every time, all the time. If it's God, it's all 100% because God is a God of his word. It'll always happen because God says to do it. I can tell you, I'm, I'm living proof of that. Because I had a good job. I had to leave two good jobs. Oh, you've left a good job. I had a good job. One day I woke up, God says, you're the wealthiest guy in the church. And I'm like, I am? I didn't even know it. We had special needs people in our home. We both worked in schools. We're making money. And this is the second time God told As soon as he told me, I said, oh, no, I knew something was up. He says, leave it all. You see, you have to be able to leave it all. That's the thing. You've got to be willing to give it all if you have to. Twice we had to do that. Twice you guys, at the height of our finances, in, in the business area, and then working in the school, and all the favor and all the money that was coming in, twice I had to leave everything, and we had to give everything away. And I'm telling you, we, had, we, had, we were making good money, especially this one time. But you know what? We willingly did it, because God said, will you do it? We said, yes. And both times, the only thing we could keep was our car. The first time was the Chevy Citation in 1982. They're lemons. You ever heard of a Chevy Citation? We bought it because you could put 31 grocery bags. You have one? She has one. Hallelujah. You might be able to get good money for that. It was a faith mobile? Maybe mobile. Before your time. What's that? Well, they recalled ours after three months. You know what our color was? Black and champagne. I mean, what's champagne? But that was our color. Oh. And God says you can keep everything except the car. Thank you, Jesus. So we kept the car. <laughs> Why am I saying all this? Oh, there's something in the spirits about the pop here. In the area of receiving. Not just giving. You better, re- you better get ready to receive. That's my word. For Canada, the time of receiving is here. The time of receiving is here. You know what we're going to receive? We're going to receive sons and daughters. Isaiah 60, when the glory of God comes on you, your sons and daughters will come from afar, the Bible says. I, I, you know, and nations. I'm just going to say, you get, I know there's nations. I know there's nations on your ministry, but there's more nations coming. No, I know. I feel it. You're going to raise up sons, not just prophets and apostles. You're going to raise up sons. I know this ministry is going to raise up sons. Sons about to pop in the spirit. But the reason why in Canada... We have a lot of warfare against these kind of ministries is because of the, the impact that it's going to have. It does have, but it's going to have. And the devil, there's a few things he doesn't want. He doesn't want holy roller prophetics having their prophetic come to pass and living clean for God. He doesn't want that. That's not what he wants. He doesn't like that. He doesn't want people to know that God's a God of his word. He wants them to think that if there's a God, what a bunch of flaky people he's got out there. And you're better off to stay where you are than join that bunch. Really, that's where it's at. So if you're, you know, if you're flaky, be authentically flaky. I mean, don't, don't go do this. And, well, your crowd isn't like that. But we go to some places and I tell people, stop doing that. I mean, they scare me, some of them. This one lady was a ha, 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 ha. And every time I go to the church, she was a leader. And she'd do this, ho, and ho, and she worked on the farm, I guess. She was hoeing all day. I mean, ho, ho, ho. But it would scare me in the middle of the meeting. Wow, that whole arm would get flying. Eh? Now, I know that can happen. And you should say, you should talk. I know. But that's why I talk. Because it comes on me, too. 
But you know, there's an appropriateness even of strange things. Really. And, the old, and, and one day I went, I said, I, hey, honey, remember that? She was with me. I brought, you know, I needed to have backup. And so I said, <laughs> now, if, if you do that, God bless you. And I'm not saying it's not from God. I've seen some, you know. I said, what is that? She goes, that's the, uh, the I forget what it was, the sword of God. I says, you know, I'm, it's, I said, it's, it's a natural reaction to the spirit of God. She goes, what? No. I said, yeah. I said, it's a natural reaction. Because I said, I had that sometimes. I had to deal with it years ago. God said, don't. And I'd be in the service and it felt really good. So there's things that some people do. But however, there's some people do stuff like it scares everybody around them. I mean, you're jumping out of your seat and then you don't know when it's going to happen against you. You're on, you're on pins and needles. <laughs> no, really. I told her. I said, I said, you know what? God bless you. And I said, the reason you're, you're, you keep doing it is you're afraid. that You grieve God if you don't. She said, that's right. I said, anything out of fear is not of God. So don't stop that's doing right. it. That's right. Yeah. That's Some people do things and they keep doing them. Did you know that? Because they're afraid if they stop doing them. Maybe that's not you. But you know what? That's for at least one person here. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. So if that offends you, have a double. Just take a drink. Wow, I'm telling you, there's a lot of oil in here. But you know, I'm not, God's ministering it tonight. He's ministering oil. And he's so wonderful. If you could see Jesus, how he comes to minister. He still brings a towel and a bowl. Do you know that? He still does that today. He humbles himself. The Bible says that God humbles himself. Man, to look upon the earth. That's what it tells us. God's so humble. You say, well, he doesn't need to be. That's just the point. He doesn't, but he is. Oh, the Bible says, he, Thus saith the high and lofty one who dwells in the high and holy place with him who is of a, a contrite and a broken heart and a broken spirit. To revive the spirit of the contrite. To revive the heart of the humble. That's what the Bible says. Wow. You know who lives with God up on the mountain? The humble. How does that work? Go higher, you'll end up going lower. Oh, to the lower place, which is, I'm talking about the low place with God. Oh, hallelujah. It's your greatest advantage in ministry, God told me, is humility. If you'll esteem others better than yourself, and you believe that others will have a greater ministry than you, you'll believe for the next generation too, not just you. Now, first of all, you've got to get it because, you know, you don't want to give bad stuff to the next generation. A lot of people, they start giving stuff away before they should. That's the problem. And they end up giving religion away. And they limit God, and then the next generation is worse than them. Right. And you have a religious bunch. And there, I mean, there's churches in Quebec, with, and there's the same churches here that are so dried out. I mean, all they are are empty buildings. There's so, suddenly so many of those old, beautiful churches now. Yeah. There was one about, five mile, or about 10 miles away from the town we live in. A great big, old, beautiful church. They sold for $8,000. Wow. Wow. I mean, beautiful stone building. Over 150 years ago. Wow. Used to be a Methodist church. The Methodists had revival. But see, the thing is, you can't just have a doctrine of holiness. You have to have a lifestyle of holiness. And you need the glory. And a lot of people like the holiness, and they they don't want any of the glory. Well, you know what? After a while, it just peters out. Because the glory, I tell you, you stand in the real glory of God, the fear of God will come on you. We don't have enough of that. We need the fear of the Lord. Everyone, we need the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! And the oil. Okay. <laughs> Where am I going tonight? I don't have a clue, but I'll tell you what. We're going to get some oil tonight. Because some of you, you, you might not have that, you know, you know what, what is that? The oil checker. You, you might not, maybe some of you haven't checked that because everything seems to be going good. Check it. She called me a dipstick? Man. Oh, yeah, check it. You guys, like, it was like rusted on, eh, honey? I couldn't pull the thing out. And mine's about, I mean, it's one of those things that coils in, and I couldn't, I couldn't move it. I thought, I'm in trouble. I mean, the, I mean, the thing wouldn't move. I'm getting an oil change. I mean, I put in three quarts of new stuff, but it, that stuff must be blacker than the ace of spades in there. You don't want that. Old oil's no good. You know that, right? So we're trying, yeah, I mean, I'm not talking in the spirit. However, I'll tell you one thing, what God does. You know how he builds? He, man wants to build with things that he can control. Wood, you know, screws, nails, glue, stones. But you know how God builds? Wind, fire, oil, 
water. You notice that? I will build my church. When the Holy Ghost came, what happened? Sound like a mighty wind, rushing wind? Fire came on their heads. Well, yeah, yeah, he's building his church. Man can't control that. You can't control that. Go try to control the wind. What can you do with a fire on your head? I mean, you can't control the fire on your head. And if you do, it'll burn all your head off. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where am I going with this? Heaven. <laughs> Many people say, Charlie, what's up? I say, heaven. I can't control myself. It got everybody. If they ask me what's up, I'll say, heaven. They'll go, heaven. If we're in a grocery store, wherever we are, what's up? Heaven. Heaven? Yeah, heaven's up, hell's down. Up is better than down when you die. That's a good, you can witness in 10 seconds. Just like the wisdom of God, it doesn't matter who's out there. They don't believe, but they, but whatever. God, yeah, God has a way of getting through to people. Hallelujah. Because he, he wants to reveal his mystery, his mysteries, but who he is. See, he wants to reveal that. Ah, but he'll test you. You say, God will test Absolutely. How much is your dignity worth to you? That's number one. Not just in here, out there. Oh, hallelujah. You want people to know you're a Christian? Oh. Dignity. That's the first thing, first thing that has to go. If you want to get close to God, and you really do, and you want to get close to the glory, you've got to get rid of your dignity. No, you have to. Now, some of you are way beyond that. I know I am. You, you know, God will just, if you don't, he'll shake you up. Right? David said, you say, where's that in the Bible? I asked God the same thing. Because the first service I ever did, the first big meeting I ever did. And f- you know what? I always wanted to be up in the front. I always wanted the mic and the big meeting. See how it felt like, be up there. You know, just, I finally got the mic. 1,200, uh, I don't know, a lot of people, over 1,000. And all I did was this when I got the mic. <laughs> I couldn't control it. And we had the big guys sitting in the big chairs in the big church with all the people watching. First time I ever, I ever, and I was the announcement guy. So all I was doing was giving the announcements. I thought that'd be cool to be up there. This thing's a dangerous thing. It costs you everything to stand up here with this thing. And I'll be judged more than you, the Bible says, because I'm holding this thing today. Just let not many of you be teachers. You receive a greater judgment. That's why we have to, we have to really give people the image of who God really is. That's what preaching is all about. It's telling people who God is and who he isn't. He's always a good God, never bad. He's never done anything bad to you ever. Not one thing that's ever happened bad. Now, do things happen? There's pain for the yes. But he's never done a bad thing to you ever. Because God is good all the time, every time, every day, and all the time. And if your experience doesn't line up with that, it doesn't matter. Go over to God's experience. And he's good. That's why you got to say he's good in the middle of everything. That's how Job made it through. His wife said, curse God and die. What kind of a wife is that? We never hear what happened to her. But didn't say he got a new wife, so. Curse God and die. What kind of a wife was that? Right? We know. I mean, Job, Job is looking for some help. He's covered in boils. He's scraping them off. I mean, that's pretty bad. His wife says, why do you hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Get it over with. He wouldn't let go of God. He would not let go. I love, I love the book of Job. I tell you, I get more of the book of Job than almost every book, any, any book in the Bible. You know why? Because God whispers the mysteries of his spirit to me. For instance, he told me this. Oh, this is free. This will do you really good to set you free. He said, whenever I ask, whenever I, meaning God, whenever God asks a question in the Bible, that's one of the best classrooms you could ever be in in your life because I don't need to know the answer. I already do it. I already know the answer before I ask. So if I'm asking a question, it's for you to learn something. Oh, you ever think about that? I never thought about that. Remember those ugly Pharisees? Trying to trick him? Who do you pay pay taxes? Well, he didn't answer him. Give me a coin. Whose inscription? Ask them a question. He didn't need to know. I'll tell you, you learn a lot of stuff. So in the book of Job, you find God asking more questions than any, more, any other Bible, any other place in the Bible, in the book of Job. Because for a couple of chapters, a whole bunch of chapters, God asks Job questions. <laughs> oh, God, I love God. 
His ways are past finding out, but he'll whisper stuff in your ear. I read one day where, where Job asked God, uh, uh, Job, God said to Job, Job, have you been in the treasury of snow and hail? I think it is. We'll go there in a minute. Because that's where I want to go where God is. I don't, know where, I don't want to go where he isn't. And I said, God, there's a treasury of snow and treasury of hail, I think it says. And I'm like, if God said there was, then there is. This is not a metaphor. This is not poetry. If God said there's a treasury of snow, then there is. There's a womb of ice. Oh, I tell you, there's a lot of stuff that you can understand if you go to God and say, I don't know nothing, but I do. I want to know. God, I don't know nothing. And don't tell God you see everything either, because you don't, neither do I. Jesus said, the Pharisees, because you say you see, you're blind. Yeah, and he said, I've come to open the eyes of the blind, though. That's what he said. Woo! He said that. I've come to, come to open the eyes of the blind, blind those that see. So you always have to come to God. Don't pretend you know all the Bible and you obey all the Bible. I, people can be, I don't, I don't know where any of that stuff was in the Bible. It's, all, it's in there. I'm obedient to the Bible. I said, you're not obedient, you liar. Well, yeah, but I am. And I said, you give, you give one another a holy kiss. Well, then you're not obedient. Paul said, greet one another with a holy kiss. I said, I don't do it either, don't, but don't pretend you do everything in the Bible. Right. You see, I'll tell you what, that's what gets... God doesn't like that, let's put it that way. When you think you know everything and you don't come to him humbly. Oh, this is good for us tonight. Woo, we're going to go higher. So I went into the treasury of snow. How did it happen? I forgot about it. Six months later, I'm worshiping God. And I have visions. And I just, I, I don't even know where I am. Some city, sometimes I'm preaching, I'm not here. I'm here, but I'm not here. And, and I'm preaching, I'm like, and then all of a sudden I realize, where am I? I don't even know. I'm like, I'm in Hamilton, it's somewhere near, the, okay. The, okay, yeah, that's where I am. That's what will happen. I was in the treasury of snow and I saw this, and I said, God, where am I? He goes, I saw the snow, and I was inside this mountain. It was so wonderful. I said, where am I? He said, you're in the treasury of snow, because I asked him. I wouldn't mind going in there one day. Well, when I was worshiping God and completely forgot about it, I went in. And it is a place. It's in the Bible. God talks about it. He asked Job if he's seen it. And I said, well, if you ask Joe if he's seen it, that means you can see it. I'd like to see it. But he did it when I was worshiping God, and he snuck up on me. And see, God, one of God's names is El Sneaky. Yes, Jehovah Sneaky. I believe that. Yeah, you know him too. So then God says this. In this next season, every place you're going to go, it's going to snow. Now listen, if I can give this anointing away to you tonight, you can have it. What happened to me after that? I, you know, we're not talking about, you know, the snow and, you know, a couple of snowflakes. Better not snow tomorrow. You never know. Could snow tonight. And so, that was that season, but it still happens in the winter. But it, we, we were right after that. We're in London, Ontario. And we're, we're you know where that is? Oh, yes, we're in Ontario. And so... We're flying in, and, and they, they have the prop planes that go, you know, you know those planes? Anyway, so we're coming, and all of a sudden, like we leave, and it's all green where we lived, and beautiful, nice, and all of a sudden, we're coming in, and all of a sudden, we just go into the snowstorm, and you can't see nothing, you're looking out the window, it's just snow, and, we're, and the, the plane's already going, now it's going, and, it, and you're like, I'm like, oh, Lord, help us all, and so, and I thought, I, I know that we're on the descent, we're coming into London, but I'm looking there, and all of a sudden, you know, the wheels come out. I'm sitting by the seat, but the wheels, and they don't come off. They come down like that, and there's the wheel, that, you know, that one. Well, it comes down. I thought, we're going to land. We can't see nothing. We can't see anything. We landed in a snowstorm. We landed in a blizzard. I got out of the plane. I almost told the pilot off that he shouldn't have landed. I'm like, we like, couldn't see a thing. So we landed. They couldn't get, we had to go, we had to go down the stairs, and, and we're going out, and it's a blizzard. I mean, a blizzard. And I said, oh, God, I went in the treasury of snow. i got to watch out what I asked for. And so we get there. I get picked up. The pastor says, do you know? And he, and he, and he showed me the newspaper article. It said, Blizz, uh, it said uh, 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 the next morning, five, five or six hundred accidents on the day we came in. And they had a blizzard. And, and, and I mean a blizzard blizzard. Now, I found out afterwards that does happen from time to time. But he said, he showed me the paper where it said it was supposed to be like 65 or... Anyway, it was supposed to be really nice that day. And I said, well, what happened? So we go to the church. 
Six months before we'd arranged this meeting, I walk in the church. He doesn't know that I've been to the church. He just know nothing. We go in, and you know what the name of the conference was that he named six months before? Blizzard of Blessing. That's what he called it. I said, you got to be kidding me. Did you do this? Did he said six months ago we had that. And it happened over and over and over. Let's, you know what? We'll go, we'll go back to Exodus 17. I want you to go to Job. We'll, we'll get to Exodus. Hallelujah. Oh, I'll tell you what. God's about to move. He's about to pour out oil in you. Some of you are going to get filled up again. See what happens when you're full of oil? Your faith rises up again. Everything goes up. I'm telling you, things run better. If you don't have oil, no wonder my, my engine was making noise. And it was. I was like, remember, honey? I'd say, honey, the engine's... But I, and I never thought about oil. I mean, most of you would. I didn't. It was just making noise. I don't know. Okay, Job. Hallelujah. 38. I'm glad you asked. See, you asked a question. There we go. 38. 22. But you're going to find out why Canada is so blessed. God told me Canada is like the sides of the north. He loves Canada. God does, by the way. It's like the sides of the north, and I'll tell you why you get so much snow. And I'm like, tell me. Verse 22, have you entered the treasury of snow? Wow. Or have you seen the treasury of hail? Now, that's good. But what's it there for? See, just an experience won't do you no good. I had an experience in what? You have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? Well, here's the end. Verse 23, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war. Oh, I'm going to say that again, which I reserve. Reserve what? The treasury of snow and the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the day of, what is it? The day of trouble and the day of battle and war. I'm here to tell you that God does not change. He still comes the same way. We think in 2012, God does none of this stuff. He does all of this stuff. Read Psalm 18. It's my favorite. I just read it over and over and over. God comes in a dark cloud. He comes with thunders. He comes with lightnings. He comes with hail. When? Today. You may not see it, but I've seen it. You can ask my wife. She's been with me. We have seen these. You know, she's not a shaker and a baker. My wife knows God. No, she knows the Lord. I've never ever seen her manifest one time in any meeting ever. Except when James Maloney prayed for you and you screamed as you screamed that was good so she had one she got the screaming anointing but you know what she likes it all but that's just you know her, she is faithful she's strong in faith she's full of the glory of god and you know what you don't want to have two of me anyway if we both did this i mean what we wouldn't get anywhere so we need somebody that can think you know i tell people you know what you don't want a brain surgeon who manifests all over the place you know <laughs> You want somebody with steady hands, right? So, you know, not everybody can shake and bake. Right? Some people say, I want to be like you. I say, no, you don't. No, you want to be like you. You're made in the image of God. Let the Holy Ghost flood you, but then get ready. Put on your seatbelt. Some people, I say, take your seatbelt off. Let God hurdle you through this, the air or something. I mean... Some people, I mean, you know, the dipstick was stuck. Some people, I mean, they've, they've had the seatbelt on so long, it's, it's rusted on. You need to take it off. Let God send you somewhere, do something to somebody, anything for anybody. I mean, but here's what, I've got to share this with you. I'll tell you why. Because we're in this day. The day of what? Day of troubles on the earth. Did you know that? Even the world knows it. The world knows the day of trouble is here. They know it. The, the day of trouble's here. You know, the Bible says the day of the Lord is dark. It's the day of glue, all this. Why? That's, that is to the unsaved and those that aren't right with God. But it's going to happen. And when it comes, all sorts of stuff's going to happen. Everything's going to shake because God says he's going to shake. Everything can shake. So what? So that that which may be shaken. So what? That which cannot be shaken may remain. That's why he's going to shake everything and everybody. So that that which cannot be shaken may remain. We're in the season. Hallelujah. But I've got a secret weapon. Snow and hail. I do. And the roar of the lion, if you believe it. Oh, yeah. Because I've learned how to release all this stuff by the roar of the lion. And if you, you, know, if you travel with us, it would not just a few meetings here and there, but over time, and especially in some places, God just shows up. When the lion shows up, stuff can happen. Not always, but stuff. We went to, where'd we go, honey? Toronto Airport Vineyard, when, when they first got hit. It hit. How many, how many went to Toronto and 
ended up on the carpet. I, and we knew people. I remember with Patricia King, our secretary. Like we, our office is in Patricia's house, and uh, she was pack hawking back then. And all of a sudden, our, the secretary left, and she became a secretary to this guy in Toronto. We didn't know his name was John Arnott. We didn't, you know, we sent her off to the party, the whole thing. Well, a month, that was in December. Well, a month later, Patricia runs down. She puts it on the speakerphone. And there's this woman screaming. I, I, she's a lunatic. I'm like, who does this? And remember, honey, that se- she never said a word. That secretary, she was just like very, very quiet and reserved. And, and I hear, and she puts on the speaker, the speaker box. And I hear this woman just ranting and screaming. And I hear this, Rah! In, in behind. Rah! People scan. And I thought, what is that? And uh, she's like, God is moving. And, well, she phoned her up right in the middle of revival when it's happened in Toronto. And so Patricia's like, I don't know if this is God, and I'm almost certain it ain't, because I'm like, what is that? And this is all going. And so, and Patricia was concerned, because we were bringing in a revival guy, and we, she's like, we need to know. And she goes, Charlie, is this God or isn't? And then I said, Patricia, if you don't know, we're all in trouble. That's what I told her. <laughs> but you know what God told me as soon as I said that? He told me, ask her a question. I'll tell you, questions are good. Now, some people give you flaky coin. Why would God have it? I'm not talking about that question. Talking the questions that children would ask. Uh, I said, Patricia, can you tell me right now that you know this isn't of God? She goes, you know what? I can't. She, I said, then don't throw it out until you know it isn't. A lot of people throw it out just because it's different. Because they haven't seen it before. Well, it can't be God. But what does the Bible say? I'm doing a new thing. That means you've ne- never seen it before. If it's new, you haven't seen it? It's new. Well, I, that was not God. Well, it's, you don't swallow everything and every wind of doctrine that blows through. But you know, you don't throw stuff out either until you know it's not God. And too many people do it. The majority of the body does it. It looks different. They threw Jesus out. They threw the disciples out. The prophets in the Old Testament, they threw them out, most of them. I mean, most places where the prophets prophesied, or where they prospered, was under the kings. It wasn't even the, you know, they didn't get the, the blessing of the of Israel, they get the blessing of, you know, the Pharaoh, Joseph did. You know, Daniel got the blessing of the, you know, the ungodly kings. Amazing how it works, eh? However, all this is going, you know, Patricia, she knew it was of God. She got invited because Mary Audrey Raycroft, I don't know if you were, know her. She was on, I was on Patricia's board with her. And she invites her about a month later. So they, they're in the church. Patricia's sitting on the front row. It, wasn't, it was the first time John wasn't there. So it was a couple of months later. And whoever had the mic fell down. The mic on the floor. So the next leader got up, started talking. He fell on the ground. So two people are on the ground. Somebody else came up and they ended up on the ground. Mary Audrey looks at Patricia and she says, well, you want to take over? <laughs> so Patricia got up, started to speak, and she didn't fall down. She came back and said, you're definitely of God. I got to preach there and it's all God. I said, well, praise God. So hallelujah. <laughs> Last man standing. But let me, I, I'm telling you this for a reason because I see the jets coming in, in the spirit. See, this is a, this is a, if I could say it, this is a, this is the Air Force of God ministry. That's what the true prophetic ministry is. It's the fighter jets up here. Now, there's ground troops, you got the Navy, you got all that stuff. But the prophetic, the true prophetic of God is the Air Force in the kingdom. The problem is, most people are stuck in the old school of warfare. We, we just think there's one kind of, you know, warrior, you know, with... Yeah, the shield, yeah, you have all that. But a shield now and a shield in King James' day are two different things. And warfare is different. However, it accomplishes the same result, destroys the enemy. However, you need the Air Force. But a lot of the ground troops don't like the Air Force, so they try to shoot the Air Force down because they don't look like them. A lot of people don't like the prophetic. Doesn't look like me. Shoot it down. Well, don't do that. So I heard somebody roared in Toronto. I told that because I saw that fighter. I mean, a big one with lots of stuff. There's a plane in the spirit. That's what I, I, I don't know if I've said it, but many times I see it when I come here. It's the Air Force, you guys are here. That's the true prophetic of God. Yes. And you need it. It knocks out the communication of the enemy. Did you know that? Yeah. When they went into Iraq and ever since then, they use the AWACS. They go in and they just knock out the communication. First thing, you need the prophetic. Because if, if you can't see what you're doing, you're going in blind. When you go up here... That's why, that's why God says, he'll renew your strength like the eagle. The eagle goes up really high. And he gets to see from a total different van, vantage point than, than you would if you're standing here. You go to Israel, they took us up. 
because we had some VIP treat. They took us up to the high places. That's where all their stuff is, in the high places, what they want. The enemy wants to control those too, but God's already given them, to him, given them to you. Right? Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, that's why you want to come up higher. That's why the eagle. Oh, see, you know the problem with many people in the church? They're stuck in the crow's nest. They should be up in the eagle's nest. And I tell people that because God told me to tell the church, get out of the crow's nest, get up in the eagle's nest. Now, the crow's nest is about that high, but you need to get up in the eagle's nest way higher, up in the mountain with God. Because if you're in the crow's nest, that's, that bad stuff happens. That's where the words come. That's where the negativity comes. And if you spend all your time on the ground, you never go up in the mountain, you're going to have problems. And people don't know how to come up to the mountain of the Lord. They don't know how to, you know, just do it by faith with God. Don't do it in a meeting. Go home and spend some time with God and say, you know, read all the scriptures where God says, come up, you know, come up to Mount Zion. In the latter days, men will come up to the house of the mountain of the Lord. So anyway, I want to talk to you about roaring, and then I want to talk to you about hail. Then I want to talk to you about what I believe that God is about to do. So this isn't your average Friday night meeting. Hallelujah. I'm not saying it's the best meeting you're, you're ever going to be at, but I'll tell you, in, in, at your church, that was a good meeting. Now I'm telling you, God came like a big ball of fire, right? And he did. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. A big ball of fire. You know that God is a fire. He's a consuming fire. He comes like a big sun. The Bible says he's a sun and a shield, S-U-N. I saw the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness, with healing his wings. I saw it here in the tent. Then I saw it, and all the wings broke up and went over people. It was awesome. And God just came in. It was, oh, man. It was beyond heavy drinking. I mean, it was amazing. It was just God himself. And that's what you want. You just want to go, God shows up. And when God shows up, that's it. You know, he starts talking to people. <clears throat> You're talking, but he's talking. He's moving. He's healing. And so here's what happened. Because I believe there's the dual thing of the, there's the lions always here. But the eagle, you I, I just see the eagle that's coming. The young eagle's coming. That's what Bob Jones, I remember, if, if, if you know who Bob Jones is, he, he, uh, he, you know, he died when he was 19, in 1974, but he raised a man from the dead about, I guess, 20 years or so ago. And he raised a man from the dead, and the guy was mad because he just met his wife in heaven, and he was about to meet Jesus. And the Lord says, you've got to go back down. Bob Jones is praying for you. <clears throat> Didn't want to go back down. But he said, give Bob this message. You can check this on the internet, so it'll fill in all the bugs. But the message was, they was to go to Redding, California, and he said, when uh, a thousand eaglets are released, he said, you will know that it's the beginning of the billion soul harvest in the last days, the last days harvest. And, talked, and he already, so that was his message. So he gave it to him. Well, he went to Redding. Have you ever been to Redding? How many have been to Redding? <clears throat> Not too many. Some... How many know who Bill Johnson? You know who Bill Johnson is? Okay, Bill. So, um, I mean, I've been to Reading. <laughs> right? it's, you, 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 basically, what would we do? We'd go and have a meal, you know, on the way down to California, Northern California. It's not a town you stay in, at least not off the freeway. You're like, man, I'm glad I don't live here. But you see, God doesn't choose where I want to live. He chooses places where he wants to live. We need to tell unsaved people, if I ever meet that man, some, you know, we meet, we meet a lot of interesting people and God puts them on our heart. I'm telling movie stars and those other people, we get to tell them the truth. If I ever met Bill Nye, I would tell him this because God told me what we need to tell people. If we're going to kick God out of our house, when we die, he's going to kick us, kick us out of his house. Did you get that? People need to know that if we kick God out of our house when we're alive here, he's going to kick us out of his house when we die. We don't want to get kicked out of God's house. So you know how not to get kicked out of God's house? You become his house here. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. You invited him in to school and everywhere. Hallelujah. That's what I have to say about that. So, where was I? Ready? Okay, right. So, of course, they went there and they went with another prophet and they prophesied and the whole thing. And then, of course, they met Bill. And, and about, I think it was two years ago, they graduated 1,000 students from that school. Eagles. 1,000 eagles. And that's what I was thinking when I was coming here. I, I could see it in the spirit. And God was speaking to me. The eaglets are coming. They are coming. And they are coming. They are, they are coming. I know they're coming. They're going to come. You know who's going to draw them? God. God will draw them. We can do the advertising. We can do everything that we can do. But I'll tell you this. God knows how to whistle and they will come. 
And when he whistles, they come. It's just the way that it is. It's going to happen. I know that it's going to happen. It's going to happen like Hamilton. I remember when I was here last time, I saw the beds. People are going to be bringing people out of the hospitals on beds right in, in, into this place. And you're going to see it in front of your eyes. But why am I saying all this? So we understand, you guys, what God is about to do in the season that we're in. And Canada needs to get its part. Who, how many think Canada needs to get its share of what God is doing? Does, Canada has inherited. So here's what happened. We were in, uh, where were we? We were in B.C. Sammy was a lot younger then. And um, right before we left on a, on a, on a trip to, um, to uh, Toronto, we were going to be at the Toronto airport, and we ministered all across Canada. Right before we left, I told all these young people, because Toronto had just broken out a couple of months, and I heard about this roaring. They were doing this roaring. And so I told them, hey, I'd never heard of it before, but if God wants me to roar, I'll roar. Right? That's dangerous to say that. It really is. And I just said it one time. Well, we drove there. <clears throat> First night it was there in Toronto. It's in, you know, in the original building, and there's only about 400, 450 people. The glory of God is there. I'm worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, my face. I didn't know God could do this. I didn't even know that a lion lived in me. If you're a Christian, a lion lives in you. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he's prevailed. To, to open the scroll and break the seals and the lion and all of a sudden it was like he came right here in my it was like my face started to morph into a lion literally and when i say that i had my eyes closed i could feel like this thing dividing and then this thing going like this i could feel the whiskers now you see that's odd yes very odd but i knew what was happening and i and i could feel this on the inside and not only that my i felt my hands I felt like these pads coming on my hands. And then, and then I, had felt, I had these great big paws. I didn't have hands. And it was, I was like morphing into a lion. But it was the Spirit of God coming on me. And I felt this roar coming up. But I'd never done it. And I said, God, what's going on? He said, you told those kids you roar. You're going to roar tonight. Of course, all the kids are right there in the front row. You're going to roar tonight. I said, God, no. I said, tomorrow I'll roar. He says, you're not going to be here tomorrow. I said, well, wherever I am, I'll roar, but not here. And it was the only night I've ever been to Toronto. The only night where it was as quiet as a library. The only night. The only night. I mean, it was like, I mean, the glo- you could feel the glory and the worship, but nothing was, and I'm like, I'm listening to all the stuff that I heard happen in Toronto, because I heard it on, you know, on the speaker. I, I'm looking for the, ah, da, da, and all the noise, and I figured I might be a safe place to roar. None of it's, ha- I'm like, where's the, ah, 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 I heard about. I never heard any of it. Nothing. Serious. I'm like, and if I'm going to roar, I'm standing out. So I put my hands down, and all the anointing left, and I knew I grieved God. I said, oh, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I put my hands up. I started worshiping, and it came back. It starts coming back again even more. I put my hands down, it goes away, and I said, now I'm in a quandary because I want, this is my one kick of the can. I'm in Toronto. I want to receive the presence of God. God says, I'm going to roar. So Mary Audrey comes by. Somebody else laid hands on me hit the floor. She comes by. She knows nothing. She just walks up to me. She puts her hands on my belly. She says, let the lion of the tribe of Judah come on, Charlie. And the moment I did that, I just had, just the paws come up. She says, Charlie, God wants you to roar. I'm thinking, God, it can't can't be happening. Yes. How does she know? Well, she doesn't know. God's telling her. So I let out a roar. It was the pathetic. It was, I went, roar. She goes, no, 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 no. She says, where's that guy? Can hear? I can't open my eyes. I'm on the go- and I can't get up. Where's that guy? She said. Where's that guy that prays for people for the world? So they bring some guy, and he's got his, now he's like, he's giving me, you know, I'm being resuscitated. And he's like, there's a reason God closes your eyes sometimes. So, he, so I thought, I'm going to roar. Now, when I release the roar, God just kicked in volume and everything and I released this roar I'm telling you that thing just rang around the room and the moment I did it I heard this all around the edge of the room and there was people lying everywhere I heard I went roar, and I heard roar, 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 all around the room it came back to me roar, 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 like a wave <laughs> like a dynamo and the second time I came around I'm like where were you guys an hour ago I felt like God vacuumed me out after that. I really did. I felt, I mean, 
I felt so holy after that. I felt like they, you know, they should give out buttons at Toronto. I roared in Toronto. I thought, you know, I gave... Don't mess with me. Ho, ho, ho. You know, I was ready to go. I hold in Hamilton. Hallelujah. And I roared in Toronto. <laughs> that offends you? Have a double. Glory to God. Wow. Ho, ho. So... Man. Oh. There's a reason for all this, believe me, there is. Because the Bible says this Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Oh, God's good. So, we drove all the way across Canada. I thought, you know, I roared, praise God. It's all good, you know. One time, that'd be it. Until we got to Kamloops, British Columbia. <clears throat> I tell people in the States, Kamloops is not a cereal. So we went to Kamloops, it's a town. So in Kamloops, British Columbia, and uh, Kitimat is not a chocolate bar. Yeah, yeah, you have to tell people that in the States. My dad worked at the customs in the middle of July in Quebec. People would come up. It's from the southern states. And my, my mom lives in the states. I love America. And they, and, and they would literally say, they'd have skis in their car. And they go, uh, and some would want to look at the igloos. They'd, do you have a place where you'd visit the igloos? And he'd say, yeah, we do. You just drive up this way about 3,000 miles north, you'll find them. <laughs> that offends you? Have a double. If you're from Buffalo, you get a triple. <laughs> My, uh, my wife told me there was, who's from Buffalo? What? Wow, praise God. Did you guys share with them my, my vision about Buffalo? My dream about Buffalo right before 9 11? Oh, it's amazing. Awesome. The rest of you might get some of that, but the Buffalo people, there's visitation in Buffalo. Uh, it was revival. That's what God showed me. Two days before 9 11, I had a dream. I'll come back to this. Two days before 9 11, I had a dream. And I had a dream that I was flying into New York City. And the wings flew off the plane. It was a terrifying dream. And we crashed on this big, big plane. But everybody was safe. And I got out. Again, I almost told the pilot off. I don't know what, what that. Anyway, so I got out. And the pilot's trying to calm me down. I said, I'm not going to drive again. I said, I'm never going to fly. Of course, Shirley shows up. Honey, it's okay. You'll fly. You'll, and that's what she would say. It's okay. You'll get over. You'll fly. And I said, no. I said, I'm going to take the bus. And then I saw a map. And I said, I'm going to take the, uh, the bus to Buffalo. And I woke up. And I thought, the bus to Buffalo. And so on 9-11, when 9-11, I'm telling you, there's something about even what happened in 9-11 in Buffalo. I know there is. I could tell you about, more about 9-11 because God is speaking to me again today that, listen, you, we need to listen to God. God wants to tell people stuff about this. You know, and it's not the conspiracy stuff and who knows what happened, but why it how? Oh, hallelujah. There's a, there's a greater than what you can see. And so I was on, at school Monday morning, 2000, uh, uh, nine, uh, yeah, 2001, September the 11th. I walk in, and I see all these kids walking in, and they were the kids, you know, the fighters, and I, but they, I'm telling you, nobody was cool that day. They all walked in, they didn't know where they were. They thought, the world's, is the world going to end? They didn't know. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They were just, like, lost. They were all worried. And then this one girl's crying. She's freaking out. She's on a cell phone. I said, uh, what's going on? She says, my cousin is in there. He's in the building. He's in the building today. Ah, I was supposed to be with him today. I says, you're supposed to be with him? She reached in her pocket, and she puts down a ticket. And on the top, it says World Trade Center Tour, 9.30 a.m., uh, uh, Monday, September the 11th, 2001. And they were going for breakfast earlier. And she said, he's in there. And he was in there, but he was in the restaurant on the bottom floor when the plane hit the building. And he got out, so he was okay. But when she put that ticket in front of me, I looked down, and I, it was the first day of school, so I was opening all the, you know, the pens and different things, and all, all these felt markers are, I think, colored markers, and every one of them said Buffalo on it. I said, God, the dream. He said, something's going to happen in Buffalo. He said, something's going to happen in Buffalo. It's almost like something is going to be directed in, Buffalo's in New York State. Oh, yeah. I tell you, the wisdom of God is just pouring out here like wine, oil. That's right, Buffalo. You know, it doesn't. We're near New York, right? That's right. 
Yeah, but you're a long way from New York City. But still New York. You know what? There's something that happened on, two, on, on 9-11. And I, it was almost like something got redirected. I can't explain it. And you know what? God's going to give us more wisdom. But I know there's something here because I, I, was, I was talking to Mavis. There's something about a twin here in Buffalo. And, and, and this, even the spirit and the thing and what God's going to do. You guys get ready in Buffalo. And you know what? God will do it. God, God, God will do it. And whatever's going to happen here, I believe is going to happen in Buffalo. Yeah, I feel it. Why would God give me that dream? If something wasn't going to happen. Okay, so back to the roaring. Okay, so we, we're in Kamloops, and we're driving with all these young people, and we're going to a place called Salmon Arm. You ever heard of Salmon Arm? Sounds like a stinky fish, but it's not. <laughs> salmon Arm. And it's about an hour and a half or two hours away. My wife can tell you, because we saw the, uh, the weather the next morning. On our trip there, there was not 700 lightning strikes. There was over 7,000 lightning strikes. Between Kamloops and, um, and Salmon Arm. 7,000. The whole time we were driving, it was... It started a whole bunch of little forest fires, but there was so much rain, it put it out. And so we end up there, and I'm like, something's happening. But halfway to, to Salmon Arm, or just before we got there, God says, I want you to roar. And I'm like, I'm driving like 60, 65. And when your hands turn into paws... Now, when I say this, if you're listening, on, you know, you're like, oh, come on. No, listen. You know, you said the same prayer that I said years ago. My body belongs to you. Do whatever you want with it. You ever prayed that prayer? What if he did? That's why I said, that's what happened when I went like this. I said, God, what's going on? You told me your body belongs to me. I said, this doesn't look good. He said, I didn't call you to look good. I called you to make me look good. And compared to you, I look pretty good. And, and that's what he, that's what he, that's why he doesn't, we're interested in dignity. So I start roaring. I'm driving with my wrist because I've got two paws. And I'm roaring. Well, it hits the kids and they start roaring. One guy, and it was a van. You know where the, the door opens up, there's a thing? The guy fell right in there. I thought he was going to fly, go right up the door. And he's roaring away. And his name was Rory. No, it was Rory. Remember him, the big guy? Again, wisdom is flowing. I never thought about that all these years. We're on a roll. So was he. And it was a big guy. He sort of went. <laughs> and they're roaring. I'm roaring. And then God says this. When you get there, we're going to speak to a youth group at, uh, um, at a church we've never been to. And we're going to all these places, sleeping on the floor, sleeping in gyms, sleeping in churches. So we end up there. I won't tell you the church, but it was a big church up on the hill by the three car lots, if you're ever there. And um, God says, you're not going to preach what you thought you were going to preach, you're going to preach on a form of godliness that denies the power. Preach on it. He said, because I, here's what he said. Now listen to me carefully. If you get the wisdom of God, it's done. When you get the wisdom of God, it's done. I like what Kenneth Copeland says. He says, if you have, if you are sick, he says, you don't have a sickness problem. You've got a wisdom problem. Because if you knew what to do, you'd get healed. You see, that's the way that it is. You never have a financial problem. When you, the day you became a Christian, you never had a financial problem. The only thing you had was a wisdom problem. Because as soon as you find out what to do, your problem's over. And when you hear from God and you know it, that's it anyway, before the manifestation. Then you learn how to stand. So most of your problems are not what you think. They're wisdom problems. That's why Proverbs said, make wisdom the principal thing. And so God says, don't preach on that. Preach on a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. And he said, there's a religious spirit that lives in this city Pardon me. He said, there's a religious spirit over the city. Over the city. And he said, it lives in the church you're going to. Religious spirits and me do not like each other. We don't. Because one of us has to go. And that's why when the glory comes into a meeting, and that's why I don't get invited to too many religious churches. Because when the glory comes, I don't push the devil out. God comes and pushes the devil out. Because if you stand there and you don't move, and after having done all stand, we'll find out who's standing. And the glory comes out of you, and it just pushes the devil out of the room. Woo! Hallelujah! And then God gets all the glory. And so he said, you go there, you preach in a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. From such, turn away. God's pretty plain. I like people, I love people. I don't like religious spirits, however. They're stingy, and when they do give, it's manipulative. 
I don't want a cent from religious spirits. Because they'll try to control you with money. Oh, no, 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 no. It's going to come down. It is. God's going to bring it down. But I'm going to... See, I've had a taste of all these things that I've actually seen stuff happen. That's why I can tell you these things. And the reason I can report on what God did, and, and you'll believe that there is a treasury of snow and a treasury of hail when I'm done. What happens? Here's what happened. I went to these poor kids. There was like a dozen. That's all we had. A dozen kids from the church, right? They were the junior high. They had a bigger youth group. I'm preaching on a form of godliness. And they're sitting there like that. That denies the power. And God says, your words are going up. You're talking to them, but your words are going up. So I'm looking at them, and I'm preaching, but my words are going up. All of a sudden, Shirley was there. Remember the side door? There was all these windows on the side. And I looked, and it looked like somebody was firing a machine gun from heaven. And I saw all this stuff just bouncing off the ground. It's in the middle of August. And it started to hail. And it, it wasn't golf, uh, golf ball hail. It looked like ice cubes, like exactly like an ice cube, a little bit thinner and clear. You could see right through them. And they started to fall, violently fall. When I say violently, and they fell in a three-block radius with the church on the inside. When I say violently, a month later we saw on the news, it caused over $3 million to the three car lots. It knocked the windows, not the windows, it knocked the uh, mirrors off our van. That, it's got a hail hard to knock the window, to knock the, uh, the, the, the uh, what are they? Mirrors, yeah. Automotively challenged. And so it knocked them off. <laughs> Bonnie, our intercessor, had a white Volvo. It was like you put it on the side and drove 100 golf balls as hard as you could right, on, right into the top of it. And in the middle of it, the fire truck shows up. Somebody, somebody saw fire in the church. They called the fire department. So the fire truck shows up with all the guys with the axes and the hats and the whole thing in the middle of it. And the, our ministry was called Catch Fire. That was the ministry. Which, if anybody's listening, Toronto stole. You know, Catch the Fire? No, they did. That's okay. Got to learn how to steal in the kingdom, right? So it's okay. Those things are good. <laughs> Shirley says, borrow. They, need, they needed a name for their conference. They did. Their first Catch the Fire conference. They didn't know what the name was because they knew Patricia and everything else. And we walk up and we got Catch the Fire and they went, that's a pretty good name. A month later, Catch the Fire conference. That's good. Praise God. We give it away, right? You give it away. And so, so we had a big sign in the, in the foyer of that great big church, which I won't mention the denomination, but it's at the top of the hill with the three car lots around if you ever go there. And uh, we had catch fire downstairs. And so the, I don't, he wasn't the fire chief, whoever it was, the guy with the hat, it's like backwards, and the ax goes off the fire truck, runs in, and he looks, catch fire downstairs. And downstairs he goes, I watch him go. He comes back, is this a joke, what's going on? I said, why are you here? Well, somebody called the fire department, you, you're, this place is supposed to be on fire, I don't see any fire. All we saw was hail. So we actually have, now when I say it hailed, they had a big skylight, like a, um, what it, it, skylight? But it was like, uh, what do you call that kind of uh, glass? Stained glass skylight. Broke. Just, they smashed it. So the water's coming in. Water was coming through the, re- the uh, light receptacles, every one of them. Water was coming. We had to put blankets around the equipment so the water didn't. Like it was, it was about that much water and the church just came in. And it was a mess. But I'm telling you, sometimes things that are messy can end up being very good. Because it's reserved for the time of trouble and the day of battle. A birth can be messy. But it's good. You see, we don't understand that. We, we want everything prim and proper and, you know, sit in our pew and never move for 20 years. That's the way some churches are and it's all good. No, it's not all good. Sometimes it's all bad. We have to learn how to move with God. Oh. In Him we live and move. Not in Him we live and sit. In Him we live and move and have our being. Woo! If that offends you, have a double. Oh, man. Wow, there's a lot of oil here. Okay, I'm almost done. If you believe that, I have some oceanfront property in Saskatchewan to sell you after the meeting. Okay, or like some evangelists say, in conclusion, which means 40 minutes from now, I'll be done. I got my wife here. What time? Oh, oh, it's 9.30, but I'm getting close to done. Done is a relative word. Okay, so... So, we're looking at the hail. It's, it's all over the place. We have a picture of the fire truck, all the firemen, Sammy was there, Shirley's there, they, gave, they let me wear the fire hat, I'm wearing the fire hat, and we're standing in hail, like this in the middle of August, you can't see the pavement, it's hail, on the back, because it was a big, big, big A-frame uh, church, like huge A-frame church, there was about, I would say about three feet of hail piled up that came off the roof, it looked like God emptied his 
freezer from heaven and just dumped all the ice down. But I'm telling you, something happened. Everybody said it. They said something broke. Something came down. Something got loose. I'm telling you, it's about to happen here. I feel it. It's about the breakthrough is, is here, and it's the breakthrough of water. That's what that word breakthrough means. The Hebrew word is the breakthrough of waters. And water comes in many forms. For Canada, ice and snow is water. I've told people we don't listen to God. God talks to us all the time. I was preaching. I said, it's about time we had some snow of the word. And one night he comes, that snow of the word. I said, yes, it's in the Bible. Like the rain and the snow that comes down from heaven and waters the earth. But we don't want the snow because we haven't seen it, but it's coming. Like the rain and the snow that comes down from heaven and waters the earth and the snow. And the snow, Psalm 18, God comes with thunders, lightnings, and hail, fire, and he still does. God would say way more to us if we listen to the little things that he says to us. That sometimes seems strange, but we want to throw everything out. People are like, well, we don't believe in every wind of doctrine. They don't even know what a wind is. I'm not mad at anybody. I just feel the heart of God. That he'd tell us way more if we'd, if we'd humble ourselves. And, not, and, and I'm, you know, I'm talking to the, what's in the area. And it has to obey. Because you, got, not, it has to obey because you guys have staked your ground. And the GPS says so. I don't just want a prophetic experience. You know, people go, well, those are prophetic experiences. No, those are God experiences. The prophetic, I want the prophetic, yeah, of course the experience. But you know what? It's more than that. If it's only an experience and it's not going to do anybody any good, then what's it for? God is about to, I see, he's about to put the nail in the coffin of the devil in this area. I see him nailing it in. He's going to nail it down. He's going he's to do what he said he'll do because he's not a liar. He's going to give revival here. He's going to bring, healing's going to come and everything's going to shake and bake. Okay, good. Wow. Hopefully that didn't offend you, but have a double if it did. I asked God one time, how, how, how come I, I get to do so much drinking in meetings? And how, how, how come, you know, there's wine, you turn water into wine? And he says, I don't like to drink alone. That's what he told me. <laughs> think about it he didn't have to make us he doesn't like to drink alone wants to eat and drink with somebody might as well be you i asked god why do you tell me all this stuff he says i got to use somebody might as well be you i thought okay you don't get a big head i wouldn't know any of this and I, I know less than maybe most of you i don't know but i'm telling you what i do know and i testify of those things that i've seen and heard John said, we testify of those things we've seen and heard. Paul said, we testify of those things we've both seen and heard. Jesus said, we testify of those things which we've both seen and heard. Not just heard, seen and heard. And so here we are, and the hail's on the ground, and we took the picture. Well, that would have been great in itself, ex- except I knew something happened in that church. And I walked up to the pastor, the youth pastor that night. And this is all I said. He was a wonderful guy. We know him very well. We're going to be seeing him in a couple of weeks. He lives in Kelowna. He's an amazing guy. I love this guy. He's one of my favorite guys. And I hope my favorite, one of my favorite pastors in the world is this man. And I'll tell you why. He looked at me. I asked him one question. He's, he's quite a big guy. He's not tall, but big. I said, uh, do you have a religious spirit in this city? I just, I didn't tell him what had happened up to that point. Nothing. Do you have a religious spirit in your city? He just started to cry. He says, I'm quitting next week. After you leave, I'm quitting. He said, I've been in this church, for, I think, I don't know how many years, many years as a youth pastor. He said, the kids are not allowed to call me pastor because I don't have a degree. He says, I, I get paid a couple hundred dollars. And he says, I'm not a complainer, but I'm just going to tell you the way it is. He said, I can't make ends meet. He said, we got, they had over a hundred and some odd kids. And they had junior youth and youth. And, 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 and you, I could tell God's hand was on this guy. And he says, I'm going to quit. He said, there's such a religious spirit here. He says, do you know that we have ever... Now, now listen, you can tell I'm not a pastor basher, right? I, never, I don't bash pastors ever. You can ask my wife. I love pastors. God told me, I went to a meeting once and the glory of God was moving. God says, I ah, don't think this is you. <laughs> Pointed at the pastor. He said, he said, this guy's done the seven hours of work. He said, you come and do the last hour. Everybody thinks Sunday morning church should be like that. No, 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 no. These guys do the seven hours of work. And they also see the same stuff and more. But, but so I, I can't get caught up in that. It's the pastors. And when I say pastors, 
the real pastors that God give us. Real ones. God knows who, those who are his. And so I said to him, he said this to me, that he was going to quit next week. And he said, we never led one soul to the Lord in 14 years in this church since that pastor came, the pastor they had. And he said, every time God starts to move, he shuts it down. He said, I can't handle it. It's so dry. He said, I'm choking. He said, I'm going to die here. I'm leaving next week. I took one step to him, toward him, like he was standing there, to speak to him. I didn't know what I was going to say, but I took one step, and I stepped from this world into heaven. I can't explain. I wish it would happen all the time, but it happened that day. And I stepped into heaven, and I said, I'm going to tell you three things right now. I listened to myself and watched myself say this to him. I said, don't quit. I said, in one month, within a month, a youth group is going to come into the city. They're going to be looking for a youth pastor to pastor a youth work. I said, they're going to come to you. Take the job. And I said, they're going to pay you half time wages. I said, take it. I said, but don't leave the church because I said, God is about to deal with your pastor and he's going to be gone in it very quickly. Then I looked up and I said, you foul spirit that has been in this church for 14 years, get under this man's feet. That's what I said. Now I was going to say, get under my feet, but I watched myself say it. I said, get under his feet because he had the authority. All I did was have the authority to do what I did. And then you have to know when your authority begins, but you also have to know where it ends, you guys. Because your authority ends. And if you're not under authority, I'm under authority here tonight. It's why I can say this, because I'm not usually this bold about some of this stuff, because I know these guys have paid the price. And many of you have with them. And many of you are friends. There's not just people here, there's friends. And that's, that's what differentiates real ministries from not real ministries. Some people just have subjects. <laughs> Yeah, you got friends, right? Woo! Good preaching. I know I'm near Hamilton. I mean, Cope Town, which is Hope Town. Okay, good. So, here we go. So he he hit the ground. That thing came down. Boom! It had to come down, <clears throat> and it had to come down because the word of God went up and the hail came down. God judged it. You know what he used? Hail, because it was the day of trouble for that guy and the day of battle and war. How did God respond? Hail. So. He hits the ground Saturday night. He is out like a light and he doesn't come to. We packed everything up. He was still there. I I told the youth, well, tell him, you know, we had a great time. You know, maybe we'll get together again. We left town. Because we had another meeting the next morning. So we go, eight months later, (laughs) I'm in our office at Patricia's home with Kevin Patterson. We're sitting there. I says, hey. We left Mark on the floor eight months ago. (laughs) Forgot all about him. He goes, oh, yeah, I wonder what happened to the guy. I said, well, maybe I'll phone him up. I phoned him up. I said, it's Charlie Robinson. He said, I can't believe you're phoning me. He said, I was going to phone you this week. He says, I was going to phone you this week. I said, why? Because he said a couple of days ago, he said, the organist that's been in this church for years and years and years came and told me something very strange. And he said, first of all, do you remember those three things that you told me were going to happen? Now, you know, I don't know about you. When I get in the anointing, you're as bold as a lion. But when you come out of the anointing, you're like, did I say that? <laughs> Who said that? You sure that was me? Three things? He says, yeah. He says, young, uh, young Life came into our city out of the blue. And they were looking for a youth pastor. Some other pastor, they recommended me. They came to me. They said, hey, how would you like to run Young Life? We'll give you half, half, uh, month, you know, half time wages. And you remember the words. That's what the word of God is for. And he said, yeah. Yes. And he said, you know, they had a meeting the following Friday. I mean, how does this work? He said, they voted the pastor out. (laughs) He said, the next Sunday, two days later, they won the first soul that they've won in 14 years in that church. The first soul came to the Lord in 14 years. But he said the most amazing thing. After eight months, he said, the organist came to me a couple of days ago. And she said, Mark, she says, I haven't told anybody what I'm about to tell you. And I'm not going to tell anybody other than you because everybody else would think I'm crazy. But, I, but she says, I know you won't. She says, for 14 years, every time I sat down to play the organ on Sunday morning, she said, I could feel this evil, wicked thing at the top of the church looking down and mocking us every single Sunday for 14 years. And she said, remember those guys from Abbotsford when that youth group came in? And he said, yeah. She said, you know, the following Sunday, she said, that thing was gone and has never come back. Now... How many think we need a little bit of hail? I was going to say, and if you have a garage, you may want to park your car there for the next few days. No, no. I'm not saying it's going to hail in the natural. 
Because that was a natural manifestation to prove the word of God and to prove that God isn't a liar. It says, let God be true and every man a liar. God's not a liar. God spoke about that me spoke that to me you see the enemy you know what the devil doesn't like to look because the devil wants to be like god he doesn't want all his minions and demons seeing what he says is going to happen not come to pass because he wants to be like god and he knows that one of the greatest disappointments that god has is when people think that he's not a god of his word that's why israel he gave them so many promises and they failed him he still loved them however he the, the enemies would mock god because of israel sometimes and their behavior it's the same in the church the Bible says God is not mocked, you guys. God's about to do something. He's going to shake us all up. And the Bible says he's going to do it. And if we would have told us before, we wouldn't have believed it. That means you've never seen it before. And even if he told you today, you wouldn't believe it anyway. That's how big it is. On the earth. Not heaven. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about on the earth. Yeah. I know. I know, Lord, it is. I know it's going to come. Hallelujah. Okay. I had uh, one. Uh, let's go to Psalm 18. I'm almost done. Yeah, I'm pretty well done. But I'm going to release something over you. Uh, it's already being released. Jesus is so wonderful and humble. When I say that, I didn't know that God was humble. You know, I, I, I go to Indonesia quite a bit. It's the biggest Muslim nation in the world. And I wouldn't want to serve their God. And I love Muslims. I've told, right? They make the best Christians. They, they do. And I've seen thousands and ministered to thousands and thousands of wonderful Muslims that have become Christians. Hallelujah. And they love Jesus with all of their heart. I'm telling you. Woo! Hallelujah. But I wouldn't want to serve that God that hates people. God don't hate people. Hates sin. Hates sin. But he loves people. While we are sinners, Christ died for us, right? So this is good. Take this home. I was going to say, <laughs> put this in your pipe and smoke it, but that's probably not good. <laughs> but I'm going to say it tonight only, okay? Tonight only. Put this in your pipe and smoke it. Now, now you might say, well, what? Now, wait a minute. Hang on. We're going to stay with the word here. So if this ends up on YouTube, you know I do not condone smoking pipes. But I said this before I looked at this scripture, Psalm 18. Then I, it's verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken. Because he was angry, smoke went up from his nostrils. Now, I didn't know. I forgot that was there when I said that to you, when it came to my mind. But I know that God is saying this. See, God, smoke comes out of his nostrils. How many knew that? Now, God doesn't smoke. Okay? Just for all the people that... But I'm telling you, smoke comes out of his nostrils. Now, do you think God has changed in 2012 and it doesn't come out of his nostrils anymore? comes out of his nostrils smoke what comes out of his nostrils ever, i think about this i think about this kind of god we serve i'm telling you that, that'll scare the devil half to death no all to death i mean well seeing god's smoke coming out of his nostrils because he's angry at him and what he's done to god's people because that's what that's what david's talking about it said smoke comes out of his nostrils oh and devouring fire from his mouth coals were kindled by it he bowed the heavens also came down uh darkness under his feet rode upon a cherub and flew Verse 11, he made darkness a secret place. His kind of, no, darkness. Man, darkness seems like a bad thing. Not when God shows up. Because he comes. His canopy around him was what? Dark waters. I've had God say very strange things to me. You know, if I see a, if I see a snake in the spirit for in a dream, or it's bad. Except one time, the snake showed up. And God goes, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the wise snake. And I'm like, I don't like it, even if it's a wise snake. Ah, be wise as serpents. And I'm like, God, why do you do that to me? That, because you don't have everything figured out. Why did, why did they hold up a snake? And, it, and they got healed when they looked at it. It doesn't make any sense. I don't like snakes. The devil's a snake. However, you know what? Don't be too sure you know everything about everything. That the devil is going to hell. Don't let anybody tell you he's not, because some people do. Did you know that? There's theology going around. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Have you heard that? Yeah. I'm talking about good people that I know that have been Christians like 35 years. Believe that, and they're just shipwrecked their faith. I don't preach that stuff. I'm telling you, the devil's a bad devil. He's going to get what he deserves. Just don't go with him. Yeah, keep him under your feet. Verse 12. From his brightness before him, <clears throat> from his brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones. With what? Hailstones. With what? Wow, hailstones and fire. What happened in, in um, Salmon Arm? Hailstones and fire. The fire truck showed up. 
the, you guys, the fire truck. Why? Because I believe there's fire in the spirit. And hailstones and fire, just like Psalm 18 said. Do you know that the scripture is real and that God is the God of his word? I can testify of what I've seen. And here's what I saw, that God comes with hailstones and fire. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones, it says it again, and coals of fire. Oh, do you know that God is true? He's real. His word is true. God's about to do something. I'm prophesying this, that God is about to come into this area and region with hailstones and coals of fire. He is going to come, and he's going to not just shake, he's going to burn up stuff. When I say that, I'm saying it in the spirit. Sometimes it manifests in the natural, but he's going to come the way he comes in Psalm 18. It says he sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance. Remember 7,000 lightning bolts before this happened? 7,000 lightning bolts. Over that, they said. Lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Oh, I'm telling you guys, the word of God is real. It's not a poem, and it's not stuff that, you know, it's hidden stuff to, 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 to say, well, I don't know if God... No, God, this is how God moves today in 2012, and he's about to move again. I've, I, you know, God had his roar in South Korea uh, two years ago, and he told me he was going to blow all the conflict that was happening between the U.S. and China and all that that never ended up in CNN. And so we roared, and that night they had, there was a typhoon heading to the Philippines, turned around and went right through right through uh, South Korea. Right, it knocked a big chunk right off our hotel and flattened a taxi. 185 kilometer hour winds. And God said, roar, and I'm, I'm going to blow this thing around. And he did. I'm telling you, when God, when God decides to go, it, it moves. How many want that kind of a God? That's the kind of God I want. Because that's the kind of God that the devil fears. If we have just some you know, menial kind of a thing and just hanging on for dear life in the kingdom, that doesn't threaten the enemy. What threatens him is Psalm 18, God coming like this, smoke coming out of his nose, fire coming out of his mouth, lightning, hail, thunder. That scares the devil, I'm telling you. I'm not talking about thunder like you've ever heard. I mean, thunder that will terrify, would terrify me to the core of my being, even if it wasn't aimed at me. That's how big God is. You think any of the problems in this city are too big for God? I just declare prosperity over Hamilton right now. I command those doors that were shut to open right now. I command business to come in this whole region in the name of Jesus. God, we release you out of Psalm 18. Woo! To come with thunder, lightning, hailstones, coals of fire. I won't say snow, but... Why? What has God reserved for his church? Is this just isn't in the Bible for no reason? It's a question that God asked Job. He told me, I found so much stuff about God through looking at the questions that God asked Job. It was absolutely amazing. That's how I got, that's not how I got all this stuff, but I got some of it. God said, you want to see it? I said, God, can I? He says, yes, you can. You're my son. I've already given it all to you anyway. You already have this stuff. We just don't know it. But I get to see it for you. That's what seers are for. I get to see stuff for you. It's not just for me. I used to think this was so great, and then I thought I was so great. I'm not good. There's no great men of God. There's only men with a great God. That's how it works. Some sow, some water, but God gives the increase. The rest of that scripture that hardly anybody ever quotes. So then, he that sows and waters is nothing. But God that gives the increase. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to have a few announcements. Now, what do we call them? Anointments. So don't, don't some people disengage, right? Not, we don't want to annoy you with the announcements. Not those kind of anointments. This is anointed announcements, okay? Not annoying announcements. Those I've heard before. And I like to do this, and sometimes people get healed. Sometimes the glory comes and messes people up just by talking about books and CDs. And all of the money from this goes to uh, our son's ministry. You guys, Sammy's, I talked to him yesterday. I can't share most of what's going on. It is so amazing. It just blows me away what God is doing. Yeah. And it pays to get drunk in the spirit during a meeting. Uh, you remember I shared those people in Seashell that I've got? They, more of them are getting saved, getting rocked. And they're fund managers. They're ruling the world on the West Coast, and God is getting them saved. It's absolutely amazing, you guys. It is, 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 can I share one testimony? Because the, the Lord spoke to him. He, he had in his heart years ago a ministry called Play for Life. And so this guy came up to him and said, Sammy, I'm doing, uh, he's, he's a skateboard pastor. And he, and he pastors in, in, in the, in, the um, uh, um, in Abbotsford. There's this massive like, skate park. Now, Sammy's never skateboarded in his life. So this guy came up to him and he goes to the same church. He goes, I'd like to put on a, uh, you know, a skateboard um, competition. 
And can you imagine a Christian doing that? You know the lifestyles, and I love skate. I mean, skaters, you need to have a lot of, if you want to challenge them and, and see God move, we've seen God move and touch them and shake them up and all sorts of stuff. But he's just going to have this. So he says, okay, I'll raise the money. He says, I'll raise $3,000. And he did, like in a day. He phoned the guy, the guy says, I'm in. So prize money, $3,000 for skateboarders, they're coming out. You're going to get the best. So they just had it last weekend. Now listen to that. He just phoned me up. Uh, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday, coming, coming in. Or yesterday when we were driving. And he said, he says, Dad, they had, number one, they had over 500 people showed up. 500 people. They had over 100 skateboarders come out. And they gave out $3,000 worth of prizes. They, they, they got rid of how many? 250 hamburgers, 250 hot dogs. They fed all these kids. And it was absolutely amazing. And, but here's what God does. So they, you know what? He says, Dad, we're not going to preach. We're just going to do it. Now they have, it was, the, the name of the ministry, the ministry that was doing it is called Love Bomb. That's the name of it, right? Love Bomb. That wouldn't work in Indonesia. You've got to watch out for those titles. But there it does, Love Bomb. And so, and then, you know, they had his ministry on the bottom. Chrysler was one of the sponsors. I mean, all these guys, big companies got in, skateboard companies. So I had all these people, and a lot of the kids, they read that like, I'm coming out. So, but here's what happened. They had a great day. The peace of God was on it. God moved over people came. He said, dad, it was just in the paper. They just had it in the paper. They had a big write-up about it, big hit. And he was all, but this is what he was excited about because one of the policemen in the city went to it and his son was there and his son had so much fun. And his dad was like, man, I never knew the skateboarding. So a couple of days later, his dad, who's a policeman, not dressed in police gear, went down to the skateboard place with his son. But when he was there, he saw these kids smoking pot, just a whole whack of them, eh? And he was so grieved. And he, so he went back. And Sammy said the next, uh, what was it, two days after, they arrested seven drug dealers right there. They arrested them. Arrested them. Took them out. Off. Listen, when you do the will of God, your drug dealers will be arrested in the city. Twice in Edmonton. Twice. Twice. Two times. God gave me the word. You're, you're about to get the biggest drug bust in your city. A week later, they had the biggest, right in the paper, they sent me copies in the email. The next time I said, you got to have a bigger one, they had a bigger one two days later. What? When you do the will of the Lord, and you do what God told you to do, God will clean up the city. You see, it doesn't even, they didn't even preach. You know what happened? The Spirit of God is cleaning that place out. And now the word is out, go there, but don't smoke pot. And that's what they want. I mean, how can you control that? And that kind of, a lot of those kids, well, they're not smoking pot anymore there. And you know what? The city phoned up his friend. He said, we need a skateboard pastor, so we're going to pay you part-time wages. So the city is hiring him to be a skateboard pastor at the skateboard park. <laughs> now, my son, his friend, the skateboard pastor. Listen, what can God do with one idea? You know what? You say, man, they didn't even preach the gospel. No, you know what? God, did, God told him, no. Because you know what? Sometimes you preach the gospel. Sometimes if you preach, you'll scare everybody off. You've got to know what you have, the wisdom of God. Anyway, so that's just, that's free. Okay, here we go. Now, some of you already bought a whole lot of stuff. And last time, praise God, and Sammy and Kristen were blessed. Uh, this was Developing the Supernatural. This is with uh, Stacy, myself, Fateen. How many like Fateen? Yeah. She's living in the States, but we love her. Hallelujah. She does come back and do, how many know she's married and lives in the States? She lives in beautiful Phoenix, I think it is. You just, isn't she amazing? Oh, yeah, you just had her. I haven't seen her for a while. She's married off, too. What's that? July 18th, she was here. You said he got married to a strange guy. No, he's not strange. He's a basketball coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, is he? Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. Was he here? Oh, I like him. Because I played basketball for almost forever. Sean Gaby, you know him? Patricia King's on here. And Sammy. And you know what? I, we just asked these guys to preach on, you know, how do you do what you do, basically. And so they preach about testimonies, but also how to develop a culture. So that's, how, that's how you do, that's what they're going to do in the city. They're going to they're go into these areas and just do what God tells them to do. And you know what? God will take care of the rest. God will get rid of the drug dealers. And hopefully the drug dealers get saved. But you know what? That takes all those drugs off that skate park and they ain't coming back. Because the kids, I'll tell you what, they won't be smoking pot there for a few years. You know what? God is good. God's about to do that here. He's about to clean stuff up here. You watch what God does even in the next few weeks. God's going to do supernatural stuff. I feel it. Plant the heavens. You have to learn what has God called. What's your ultimate calling in life? God told me my ultimate calling is to plant the heavens. And my ultimate calling in heaven will be forever. When I, uh, in eternity, will be to plant the heavens. Did you, can you imagine that? God told me what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be planting the heavens. You know, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and, and uh, how many are artists? I'm an artist. God is an artist. He's a creator. 
Hallelujah. Now, you can't, can you imagine creating a planet? No, you can't in this body. But if God gives you a new body, oh, get ready. Hallelujah. You know, God told me for all eternity, I'm going to plant the heavens. So that's, this is the only time I've ever really preached this message. I can't even remember what I preached. It was so anointed. I just preached it in Victoria. But God told me, this is what you're going to do in all eternity. And I remember right after I preached this, we were in Singapore, and I walked up to Jedediah Tam. I said, has God ever shown you what you're going to do throughout eternity? He says, yep, God told me I'm going to plant the heavens. I said, no way. I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, God is good. Hallelujah. And you say, where's that in the Bible? Glad you asked. Isaiah 51. God put his word in your mouth, covered you with his hand, that he might plant the heavens establish the earth and say to zion you are my people that's that's what we're called to do that's the prophetic ministry is do those three things anyway that's what's on this cd good uh this is you know what i don't usually we don't usually carry this but i did and i mentioned it tonight it's called living above your means a simple little story about how to live by faith and how to live out of heaven rather than here and how to attach yourself to to heaven's